Thank you also to the National Trust and to the Grobe Library for, uh, for allowing this event to take place and for supporting it. I'm very grateful for that. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the Noongar people, the Wajak Noongar people, as the custodians, traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, <clears throat> and I guess I wanted to begin my talk uh, with a bit of reflection on the remarkable achievement of Noongar people in sustaining food production in this place over such a long time. It really is a mind-blowingly long time, 50,000 years, 60,000 years. We're not quite sure yet. The, the time scale seems to keep growing. Um, but for, for all of those years, there was no backup. They had to know where the food was. They had to know, um, you know where the hunting was good. They had to be able to maintain that cultivation. Um, and it was cultivation, as Bruce Rose, I mean, um, Bruce Pascoe has demonstrated in his recent book, uh, Dark Emu. Uh, we tend, we've tended to think of Aboriginal people as wandering around the, the place, plucking the fruits from the trees and so on. But it was a very deliberate, very systematic um, form of uh, ecological knowledge um, and cultivation that they engaged in over a very long period of time. Um, so of course upon invasion the colonists brought their own forms of food production here and that didn't always take place outside of the city. So there is this very long tradition also, nowhere near as long of course as the Noongar tradition, but a very long settler tradition of urban food growing which I guess is where I, I wanted to start my talk. Um, and we tend to have a fairly romantic, I think, idea about urban food production now and how it's, how it's self-evidently a very good thing to do. It provides fresh food, it's local, there's few air miles and so on. Um, and this was also the case for some of the early instances of food production. So this is an example taken from an archive in Perth and it's from a dairy inspector inspecting dairies in, um, I think this one's in Stirling Street. So in this one the cowshed drainage um, went to a, a nearby garden, the manure was used locally, uh, the, um, the cows were fed on hay and chaff and then they were turned out in the bush, maybe, maybe that was not necessarily a good idea but um, it certainly meant that they were, they were feeding locally as well. And the milk was distributed um, by cart or I think by hand as soon as it was produced so this was probably a bit of child labour involved there as well but it was a sort of circular local um, happy kind of food production but it didn't always work like that. So um, this example comes from Smith's Lake which is in North Perth um, and is now called Veryard Reserve. So there's, there's this area of swampy ground, it's about 25 acres. Around the, 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 the wetland um, you have Chinese market gardeners producing vegetables um, and it's also the receptacle of the drainage from the Perth Sanitary Depot. <laughs> mm, not so good, uh, which drains, and there are also three piggeries on the banks. Mm. But it gets even better. So the inspector continues his inspection, he walks around, he finds that the fence comes down in various parts and he finds that herds of dairy cattle from the local dairies are being driven down to the wetland to drink. This is a wetland surrounded by piggeries receiving the drainage from the sanitary depot. So this was one reason why animals and, uh, well dairy cows in particular, but also pigs and other forms of, uh, and other domestic animals were regulated over time. So we can see in this, in this chart here, the number of dairy cattle in decreases from the 1930s. I think it starts decreasing actually in the 1920s. They start regulating to try and move these animals out of the city. The city is seen as incompatible with this kind of food production. And you can see that there were some real risks there um, in an era in which wastes were being disposed of locally, food was being grown in various forms locally. Piggeries, sanitary depot, dairy is not necessarily a recipe for great health. Um, so, uh, of course, rising land values also mean that food, is, food production is being pushed out of the cities. Um, refrigerated transport makes it more possible to have dairies outside of the urban area and bring the milk in while it's still, still fresh. So we see these trends over time of a, of a de decline in the number of livestock that are being kept in the urban area. And there's some more detailed trends in there, of course, the expansion of um, um, intensive poultry raising in the 1950s and 60s, but then the urban area grows very rapidly in the post-Second World War period and that pushes that kind of production out. Uh, if we look, turn from, um, from the livestock to the vegetables and orchards, we see a, a slightly different pattern in the expansion of market gardening in the peri-urban area in Perth into the, the, um, the middle of the 20th century and then again that very rapid decline um, in the 1960s and 70s as these food producing areas are kind of engulfed by the expanding suburbs. 
So if we turn then to, uh, to home food production, what can we see? So why, why were people growing their own food? Um, in my research that looked at this question um, in both Perth and Melbourne from the 1880s to 2000s, I found that there were a range of different reasons. So people have always been interested in taste. They've always felt or thought that um, home-produced pr home food tastes better than what you buy from the greengrocer or the supermarket. So taste has always been uh, an important reason. Uh, likewise, freshness, particularly after they discovered vitamins, there was a belief that vitamins were going to be more present or present in greater quantities in home-produced food, which was, the, after all, the freshest food you could possibly get. Um, Flavour uh, was also important, um, and perhaps also some unexpected things like masculinity. You can see this, this image here of the man cultivating his backyard with a machine. Um, in this period we're seeing greater um, urbanisation of course, but there's more men taking white collar work on. So they're doing jobs that are not, a, not as obviously or conventionally masculine as they were before. They weren't out in the sun digging and hoeing and so on. Um, so doing these kinds of things in the backyard was sort of like being a farmer in miniature and it was you know, accruing some of the virtues that were associated with that kind of, of um, you know, outdoor work that involved strength um, and as well as knowledge. Uh, we can see the front of the Yates 1932 garden annual there and of course thrift was an important aspect in home food production for a long time and I was talking to someone just before who was saying, uh, who was it, you, that's right, <laughs> about the, uh, the $70 carrot and the debate over whether homegrown produce is ever going to be cheaper than what you can buy at a supermarket. And I have to say, this debate has been going on since at least the 1910s um, in gardening magazines. Is it possible to grow food uh, for cheaper than you can um, buy it? Um, well, that wasn't uh, so much the case for people in the Depression, or some people in the Depression, as... Uh, are we going to have anything to eat or not? It was certainly the case that in the conditions of the depression uh, more people took up food production because they, they had few other options or because it was a way of supplementing the family diet uh, when funds were scarce. Um, education has been another important aspect so we can see again another Yates Seed Annual conveniently providing an image um, of um, the, the toddler there planting beans. Uh, we often feel as though it's only in fairly recent years that our children uh, have become unable to tell us where food comes from, where milk comes from, what pe where peas come from and so on. But again, these kinds of anxieties have quite a long history and even in the 1920s in some gardening magazines, people are worrying about the children not knowing where their food comes from. So again, this was another reason for, um, for people to establish backyard vegetable gardens and grow their own. Um, and finally there's sharing, so particularly in the age before refrigeration but even afterwards I think people were interested in having vegetable gardens so they could exchange produce. It was a good kind of excuse to, to share um, unique kinds of gifts with their neighbours, with their friends, with their family, with their close associates and thereby build those relationships. So it wasn't just like going out spending money and buying something, it was something that you'd taken the time to cultivate yourself. It was a very <laughs> unique and individual kind of gift and a sort of gift economy um, that people thereby entered into. So we tend to have this idea that before the Second World War everybody grew their own food because they couldn't afford to do otherwise, but that's certainly not the case. Um, we also have this idea that after the Second World War it was only the Italians, the, um, the Southern Europeans that had come to Australia in the great wave of post-Second World War migration um, that were able to grow their own food or that were interested in it. But my research found that in fact they were just the ones that engaged in it most spectacularly and most controversially. So they're the ones that people remember. If we look at the very admittedly scanty data that we have, still Anglo-Australians were very much involved in, um, in growing their own food. They just tended to do it in the backyard, in the privacy of their backyard, which was how proper Australians did it, rather than in the, 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 the flamboyance of the front yard, as some of the, um, the migrants from rural southern Italy did. It's also worth bearing in mind, of course, that there were plenty of migrants from urban areas in, um, in southern Europe that weren't at all interested in this kind of suburban agriculture. <coughs> so. Um, unfortunately, the Australian Bureau of Statistics 
didn't see fit to um, do this kind of survey every year, so we only have a few pinpoints of more accurate information on people growing their own food in backyards. But in 1992, they did a survey and they found that private households in Perth produced 5,300 tonnes of vegetables, about 5,000 tonnes of fruit, over a million dozen eggs and 65 tonnes of nuts. So, you know, we tend to think of cities as being sites of consumption, not of production, but it's nev that's never entirely been the case. There's always been production maintained in our urban areas. It's just tended to be a bit invisible um, over time, a bit distributed. I think it, it has declined, uh, but people have remained interested in, in growing food. They just tend to grow less of it these days. Um, yeah. So moving on then, but our, our food systems have, um, have changed. Um, now there's about 10 companies worldwide that dominate global food production and retail and these companies turn over a billion dollars a day. And of course these and other agro-food companies have been or are involved in land grabs, in exploitation of the poor and land clearing on a massive scale. And if they were a single country, they'd be ranked 25th in the world for greenhouse gas emissions. So this is not insignificant in this sector. Um, and some of the global outcomes of this very, um, you know, d detached on the one hand and concentrated on the other agro-food system include undernourishment and obesity. The, the long um, sort of supply chains that they involve also make our food systems very vulnerable. And we see this, for example, in the floods in Brisbane in 2011, um, where unfortunately the Rockley food, the central Rockley food market, um, was built on the floodplain of the Brisbane River. <coughs> That didn't go so well when the river flooded, so the market was underwater. Fresh produce wasn't was a lot of it was destroyed and couldn't be distributed for for several weeks. But um, but also more broadly, some of the supply chains were disrupted. Um, trucks weren't able to get through to certain areas. People started panic buying, and the supermarket shelves started emptying very quickly. Um, this is similar to um, a, fu a fuel strike in the US where one of the members of the House of Lords said that they were three meals away from anarchy because again, without fuel, the food couldn't be trucked around, people couldn't get, you know, supermarket shelves were emptying, people couldn't um, get food distributed through those usual lengthy um, kinds of channels. And then we have the more slow burn crises, um, for example, of suburban encroachment onto peri-urban food production areas. And this is, of course, a very, um, a very big issue. Still, even, um, say Melbourne, 40% of its produce is produced in the area around Melbourne. And they're now having to ask themselves questions about whether or how to protect that land, where that food is going to be grown if they allow the urban area to keep expanding onto their food bowl. And there's some areas in the US that have just drawn a line around it. I think Portland might be one of them. And they've said, right, that's it, we're not expanding anymore. We need to protect our peri-urban area. Um, and then, as Josh said, uh, there's, the, there's the big one, there's climate change, which is um, increasingly uh, disrupting our capacity to produce food in the forms and places in which we have traditionally um, produced it. So, moving on then to the link with John Curtin and the Second World War. So we do have this historical analogy um, of what, what happens when our food systems are disrupted, when our conventional food systems are disrupted. Um, in 1941, of course, Japan entered the war and this led to a supply chain disruption that unfolded over a matter of months rather than days or years. So how did this happen? There were increased forces in the region when the soldiers weren't out hugging koalas, of course they were eating. So uh, the US troops that were stationed here were many ad additional mouths to feed. Um, there was also a shortage of inputs. So when the Japanese um, took Malaya, we couldn't get rubber. Uh, fuel supplies were interrupted, so there was obviously fuel rationing, but that impacted the, um, the agricultural sector as well. At the same time, we were maintaining exports to Britain because our situation wasn't perfect, but theirs was a lot worse, um, and we felt that traditional um, obligation to maintain our, our, our export roles there. So this led to shortages and it led to rationing, um, and it, but it also led to some other responses. For example, um, they did seek to increase the expansion of commercial agriculture. So the area under vegetables in Victoria more than tripled um, in the years after 1941. Uh, and that was with American input as well. Uh, there was also expansion of local seed production. We didn't really have a local seed producing industry before the Second World War. There were a few things, but a lot of the seed came from New Zealand or further afield. So um, that, was, that was cranked up as well. 
But there were considerable losses due to lack of pesticides. We couldn't get as much nicotine, we couldn't get as much um, lead arsenate. Yeah, these were what we used as pesticides in those days. Um, so in the archival files there were examples of um, farmers complaining that their crops were just being overrun with caterpillars and there was absolutely nothing they could do about it. So this being the case, um, in 1942, um, the federal government said that they were declaring a, um, or encourage, or the state governments on the, at the behest of the federal government would declare a dig for victory campaign um, that would encourage householders to grow their own vegetables, keep their own hens, in order to fill the gap between what the commercial uh, food suppliers were able to produce and what people needed um, for good health. So this is a. Um, the announcement in January 1942 from the Adelaide Advertiser. But very quickly, this plan ran into problems. So in Brisbane, the very next day, they're complaining that, well, that's all well and good, but there's no water. The 1940s were quite dry. It was a quite dry decade. There were quite a few droughts in, the, in that time. So that was, uh, that was a difficulty. And that's from Brisbane. Um, in Adelaide, <laughs> uh, there was a lack of enthusiasm. I think this, this article talks about the, uh, the Premier starting his Dig for Victory campaign all on his little own. But they didn't. The, writer, uh, the writer's view is that it wouldn't be taken up very, um, very vigorously. The Daily Telegraph lesson provides us with a survey. So 67% of people, or of their readers, their respondents, said that they were going to Dig for Victory. Uh, but it was interesting, this particular survey, because it, it said that the vegetable growing was dominated by upper to middle class income homes. Uh, the poorer households didn't have sufficient land, uh, or the women were too busy looking after children, or they were in uh, munitions factories earning money, so they just didn't have the time. So there's these three factors, you know, or two factors, land and time. Some people also complained that they didn't have the expertise, uh, so that was an issue, and others were concerned that they, um, uh, they, they weren't able to get fertilisers or because of water restrictions, this was going to be too difficult. So already we see some of these difficulties. But we also see um, a, a kind of grassroots response occurring and some of this was led by the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association, and they launched a garden army campaign in 1942 whereby uh, women who, were, who had some available time, either after work or on weekends, uh, got together and cultivated land that was available, um, either private land, household land, or land that was um, local government land, and so on, institutional land as well. They got together and, and made these victory gardens and then they would sell the produce uh, and the funds would go to the Red Cross or various, the War Comforts Fund or various other kinds of war endeavours. Um, I think they also uh, roped in scouts and guides to help with harvesting, so some of the other sort of civic organisations around at the time were kind of mobilised behind this, this effort. Um, here's an example from Perth, uh, from Claremont in fact, so a, a very local one where we have some members of the YWCA acting on the Prime Minister's advice of using every vacant foot of land for the growing of vegetables. Uh, but they intend clearing what was bush last week into a vegetable garden. So it wasn't just kind of unused, uncultivated land, unfortunately, but a bit of bush clearing as well going on in order to grow food. Um, okay, so this then leads to the, the advent of the 1943 Grow Your Own campaign. And I didn't find actually evident, much evidence of the 1942 declaration in the archives. And I think that this, the, the lack of um, uptake by the state governments was responsible for more work within the Department of Commerce and Agriculture to organise materials to kind of provide some federal leadership on the issue. And this was what happened in 1943 with the campaign um, <coughs> characterised like this. Um, so it was a collaboration between the Commonwealth Department of Commerce and Agriculture and the State Departments of Agriculture, and it targeted individual gardeners, so it wasn't about the kind of collective endeavour of the, um, the YWCA, but very much about backyarders, householders, and so on. Um, and it was centred around a mass media campaign, so there were newspaper ads, there were radio broadcasts, posters, brochures, there were stickers on gas and power bills. Sponsored, um, and they sponsored local um, government competitions and school competitions as well. Of course, this wasn't the first time this kind of initiative had been, had been run. The Australians didn't come up with it by themselves. There's a long tradition of victory gardening. So this is a campaign in the UK during the First World War. Um, and similarly, 
this is a poster from the US during the First World War as well. Um, similarly, in the, the US also had a victory garden campaign um, in the Second World War, so here is a poster from 1941. Uh, being the US, they got employers on board, so uh, this is a really interesting initiative of victory garden plots provided by I think an engineering um, firm or an engineering department. And I couldn't get a lot of context for this for this image, but there's prizes. They've done some of the work to set it up uh, in order to get their employees involved in victory gardening. Um, gender again is important here. Women, farmers can't grow all your vegetables. Get the older children to help you, just like it's that easy. Um, because of course many of the men were uh, were either manpowered into various occupations or they were. Um, <coughs> serving overseas, so much of this work um, came down to, to women's work when they were able, although still some of the propaganda was quite uh, male-oriented. This is one of my favourite all-time images of um, wartime gardening. This is a bomb crater in the grounds of Westminster Cathedral that has been turned from uh, you know, a, a kind of symbol of the, the horror, just devastation and destruction of war into new life and productivity and beauty. So I think it's a, it's a nice symbol of what people were potentially trying to achieve, at least some of them. Um, others, of course, were just out to kill and protect their victory garden from the evil bugs. Uh, and so we return to the, uh, the Italian style propaganda, which again is drawing on that iconic imagery of the, the white farmer um, producing food. So what then was the net effect of all of this, um, of all of this propaganda during the wartime? It's actually very difficult to say uh, because nobody's, particularly in a wartime context, nobody's going around keeping very good records of what is going on um, in terms of food production. Um, allotments are a little bit easier. The UK has a long-standing system of uh, local allotment gardens. They were first taken up by workers in industrial towns as a way of supplementing their, their diet and they expanded very rapidly during the Second World War. Um, for this victory garden type purpose. And of course, they do have paperwork and registration. So it's possible to say that there were 819,000 of them in the UK before the war, and in 1943, that had doubled. So there was very much an uptake of, um, of allotment gardening. Somebody's had a stab in the dark that the number of private vegetable gardens increased from 3 million to 5 million. Um, in the US, it's even, even more of a stab in the dark. Uh, and in Australia, it's, it's really impossible to tell because we didn't have these formalised systems of allotment gardening. We certainly have um, sort of pictorial and other forms of evidence that people were out there hard at it, digging up their, their schoolyards, their churchyards, their backyards, their front yards even, um, in these kinds of images from the, um, the Australian War Memorial. So these are parishioners at a Melbourne church. Um, and these, this is a, a YWCA garment, garden army in Brighton. Uh, in, not Brighton in Melbourne. Not Brighton in, um, in the UK. So what then can we, can we learn from this? Well, these events um, that reduce access to food supply are also likely to reduce access to the kinds of materials um, that are needed to grow food. So as I've said, in World War II there were shortages of rubber, pesticides, seeds and fertilisers. But there were also shortages of know-how. So in that survey from the Daily Telegraph that I put up before, people, people said that, oh, well, I couldn't grow vegetables because I wouldn't, I wouldn't know the first thing about how to do it. Um, and the Australian government, the federal government, was well aware of this and so they included ads like this one, you know, help your neighbour get the best out of his garden. Um, if you know how to do it, then help someone else to do it as well. Um, so that, that kind of flags that um, uh, capacity for food production, and particularly for increasing food production rapidly, must be, must be planned for and it must be built up. Um, Gardeners uh, then also had better access to animals for manure. So we saw earlier that the number of animals in the urban areas decreased um, through, this, through this period. Uh, but at this time there were still horses and carts doing deliveries of various things and I spoke to some people who said that they would wait by the gate for the horse to come by so they could go out with the shovel and co collect the manure for their garden. Um, but during the Second World War in London, they were scraping the pigeon manure off the buildings to, um, to get enough nutrients to grow their vegetables. So this is the kind of thing that we don't tend to think about. If it's not available from Bunnings, where, where are your nutrients going to come from? Um, 
So yes, resilient food gardens need to plan for sourcing inputs locally and for closing, closing, closing that loop. Um, cities of the 1940s, of course, had much more open space um, and the more spacious suburbs were more productive than the inner city. So again, <clears throat> town planning needs to proactively provide space for gardening or flexible space that could be turned over to gardening um, in this kind of situation. Um, and these... Um, uh, so, okay, so this kind of top-down campaign was successful insofar as home production was increased, home food production was increased. So nobody starved, malnourishment was staved off, and indeed many people found satisfaction and respite in gardening um, during a stressful time. It's also useful to reflect on in the present because it shows us what might be possible and what might be necessary to make our cities more self-sustaining in food. We need appropriate space, we need expertise, we need the various kinds of garden inputs. So we need to ensure, I think, that we retain this kind of um, capacity. But the war also gives us an opportunity to reflect on the social and political significance of urban food growing. I'd argue that food production is never just about food, it's never just about getting something to eat. It's always enacted as part of bigger stories, stories about community, about resistance to modernity, about the freedom of global capital perhaps. So these top-down food growing campaigns were about producing food, but they were also about producing a particular kind of citizen. So this citizen was patriotic, the citizen was thrifty, industrious and responsible. And there were particular roles for men, for men and women, as we see in this, um, this uh, poster here. Although, of course, these roles were often challenged in practice. So these, this campaign targeted individual self-interest as well as a sense of patriotic duty to the nation. Many of those who grew their own food or dug for victory during war found that gardening provided respite and solace at a stressful time. And many of those who voluntarily joined the garden armies or other collective endeavours found fun and friendship. But for many, the campaign and their response signified compulsion and hardship and was experienced as sacrifice rather than satisfaction. And after the war, food production did decline, home food production did at least. Individual interests changed and without an imminent threat, these other interests could be pursued. So I'd argue therefore that patriotism was an inadequate foundation for enduring change. In recent years though, we've seen the emergence of a range of initiatives in urban food growing that are aiming not only to transform our food system, but also our social relations and in particular our relationship with urban space. So this one close to home is um, Green World Revolution, which produces um, high quality microgreens for high end um, restaurants in Perth. And they're distributed via bicycle. So it's on a little, tiny little plot in East Perth, grows these amazing greens and then sends them out to restaurants via bicycle. This one's Wagtail Farm in Adelaide, where they found a, a, a plot of land that wasn't being used, made an arrangement with the landowner to put a market garden on it got the soil tested, found that it was great soil for, for growing local food and set up a micro uh, market garden. There's rooftop honey in Melbourne, which is remarkably producing honey off the top of uh, you know, tall buildings right in the middle of the CBD. I still can't quite work out exactly what the bees are foraging on there because I mean, Melbourne's the garden city and all, but it's still pretty, pretty intensely built up in the centre there. Not too far from there is um, the, uh, the community gardens at the housing estates in Richmond where people who are often uh, migrants from um, various parts of the world are able to maintain their various gardening traditions um, uh, in company of other people, perhaps from their ethnic group or different ethnic groups um, in a kind of collaborative and safe space. There's a lovely story from um, Mildura where refugees from Burundi were given land that was, had been taken out of cultivation because of the lack of Murray River water. There's lots of this land now available. They can't grow anything on it that's profitable because they don't have the water allocation anymore. So these people, African people, use traditional cultivation methods to grow maize. Um, and this, this brought the community together. You know, there was a bit of, mis I guess, misunderstanding between or you know, misunderstanding. Lack of, lack of togetherness, they, you know, the, the Burundian community were quite separate, they weren't really integrated into the community, but through growing this corn, other people were attracted to find out what was going on, find out a bit about their culture, and then they had a big barbecue at the end where they all um, ate the corn together. <laughs> um, 
here's a, uh, an example from Mullumbimby where, um, again, farmers, young farmers are being trained to take over uh, responsibility for cultivating land or producing food on land that has been abandoned as unprofitable. So there's abandoned mango orchards and, I oh know that sounds great, doesn't it? Abandoned mango orchard. Um, and various other kinds of um, agricultural land that's no longer being used. So there's you know, young people looking for jobs, being skilled up to take over um, cultivation on this underutilised land. So that's called Future Feeders. Um, and then there's Urban Food Street in Buderim in, um, in Queensland, which some of you might have heard of. This one's a, a story with not quite such a happy ending because it, um, uh, essentially it was a, a quite regressive local government decided to cut down fruit trees that had been established and a, as a means of bringing the community together. So again, this was a project that wasn't really about food. Um, Duncan and Caroline Kemp just planted some fruit trees on their verge just to see if it would start conversations and start connections among the local community and this worked very well until the local council decided that you needed permits and insurance and um, yeah, decided to put more structure around it which seemed counter to the kind of spontaneous nature of, um, of this initiative. So bit of a plug for my book there. I talk about some of these in that book that Josh mentioned that I've um, recently edited with Nick Rose, these and other stories. Um, so these kinds of initiatives that I've just been talking about are all based on the promulgation of different values to the wartime campaign. So these are about values of inclusivity, cooperation and generosity. And I think food is powerful as a common basic need that we all share, rich or poor, white or black, we all need to eat. Yet as I've sort of touched lightly on today, our food systems have been increasingly privatised, as have our urban spaces, with poor outcomes for health and environment and community. So these initiatives are about reclaiming an urban commons, and in doing so, moving from an era of ecocide on the one hand, and competition and exclusion within human societies on the other, to an age of mutually beneficial social and ecological relationships. And a central concept here is the commons and commoning. So each town and city used to have urban commons on which people would gather wood, graze their house cow, hold public festivals and events and so on. And there was a, there was a big commons in Fremantle which uh, was retained for quite some time. I'd love to do more research on the Fremantle commons um, and its fate. But over time, however, these were alienated and sold or they were used for more restricted municipal purposes. I know that the Fremantle one was the site of the sanitary depot as well for a while. This urban transformation is symbolic of a more general trend towards privatisation, whether, whether through capitalist colonisation of the life world or states selling off public assets. So while urban development has wiped away the possibility of restoring large urban, urban commons in many places, Catherine Gibson argues that commoning is best understood as a verb. It embodies a constellation of practice that's reflective of particular values and social relations, and those values again being inclusivity, cooperation and generosity. And that's what these new initiatives are at heart about. As such, they build not so much on the forced productivity of the Second World War garden, but the long tradition of sharing homegrown produce, exchanges with neighbours before that era of refrigeration, the gifting of eggs to friends and fruit to extended family. They perhaps also build on the resistance to capitalist industrialised food systems that drove the whole countercultural food production and self-sufficiency, the sort of back to the land movement from the 1970s. It's a tall order and there's no right way to go about this, but at the grassroots level, there's lots of these kinds of initiatives providing hope that things can be different. So returning then to the title of my talk, is it time to resurrect the wartime Grow Your Own campaign? Well, yes and no. In recent years, several people concerned about the growing climate crisis are proposing that our only hope is to mobilise like we did in World War II. So Bill McKibben has even said that it's not that global warming is like a world war, it is a world war. And as a result, he's proposed a massive top-down program of construction of renewable energy um, technology factories to churn out solar panels and wind turbines on an unprecedented scale. Others have pointed out that some of the talk of a World War II style mobilisation of the population is romanticised. It presents a story of collective everyday heroism while leaving out the restrictions on free speech, the violent race riots, the imprisonment of enemy aliens and the birth of the military industrial complex. There are also important differences between climate breakdown and World War II. There's the lack of a clearly defined and agreed upon enemy. There's a range of competing agendas and also there's the scale of the problem. Finally, critics have pointed out that the problem is not just carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 
but how and whether human beings can live sustainably together on this planet. And it's here, I think, that a new urban food campaign could make the greatest difference. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you to the image providers. And